about independent lifelong learning. Let's very quickly, because you know the time constraint, we have to shift very, very quickly over different stages. Lifelong learning. Usually I'm going to talk about the what, the why, and how. I need you to think for 20 seconds about independent lifelong learning. What's the first three things that come to your head? In 20 seconds, three main things, three main categories, three main traits. Think. Independent lifelong learning. What does it take? Why we're here? Why did you choose that specific topic? Can you think how many chairs are available? Okay, I want you to share your perspective with each other. Share your ideas. Share it together in each of the tables. There is no time for ice breaking and warming up activities, so you have to know each other through your own mentality and thinking and perspective. And Shoot. I need to hear voice. Noise. Why are you sitting alone? Join any of the other tables. Gentlemen, move. Uh, at the beginning, we had a list of topics which to choose to uh, perform or do a workshop about. And actually, I chose that one. Why? Because I believe that this is the root, this is the foundation of all the other workshops. Uh, this is built on the constructivism. It's talking about the modern education, it's talking about the independence, it's talking about the self direction, it's talking about. Uh, integration, it's talking about uh, how to put science in a different context, about real life application, about the social uh, uh, networking, about integrating technology, about all the modern civilization. This is the root, this is the foundation for all of that. So from that, we're going to branch out to the different items, to the different criteria. Without independent learning, we're doing nothing. So. Our vision is to develop independent lifelong learning. We'll have a short video and then we're gonna reflect on it. In the old days, we used to think of our lives as having our education up till 22 or 24, and then we go off and work for 40 years and then we retire. Doesn't work like that anymore. Uh, people are going on until their 70s, 80s, continuing on making meaningful contributions. But the world is changing so fast today that the things you learned back in school, even 10 years ago, are largely obsolete. When I went to engineering school, the kind of things I was learning then are largely obsolete even 10 years after I got out of school. I think it's really important to come back into the educational environment, take some time off from your work environment, the pressures of that, you know, take a week, be introspective, think about it. get your batteries recharged, think about yourself in the context of other people. Meet some interesting people in other organizations or from different cultures, different nationalities around the world and see what they're doing. You can learn from them, put together a group. You may probably keep in touch with them very closely. But you can have that opportunity just in one week. You have that opportunity to say, okay, what do I want my leadership to be going forward? And how am I going to develop myself? Many people feel that, uh, you know, Leadership development is something you do when you get to the top. This is absolutely wrong. You have to be doing it every stage of your career. And that's the purpose of this program, to have a chance to really focus on that. It's no different than being an athlete or a musician. You have to keep practicing it. But I think it's just not having a series of experiences. It's an important opportunity to kind of reflect on the kind of leader I want to become. And how can I learn from what I've done in the past and transform my leadership to take on greater responsibilities going forward? Okay. Perfect. In one, 10 seconds, I need you just to choose one statement to summarize that video and write it down. What's the main code, the main statement that is really uh, being magnified in your brain? Share this statement to the partner on your right side. Well, the way is mainly free up your mind, perceptions, mentality, change your ways of thinking. Perceptions have been changed. I'd like to uh, share the key word that caught my attention. Leadership should be built at every stage. 
Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, we said lifelong process, which is continuous. Uh, yes. Learning takes place at every step of a human life. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. It's the same thing that we don't stop learning when we pass out yeah, okay. universities, but keep learning even every day. The idea that you know leadership is when you reach the top, yeah, that's yeah. so common. Mm -hmm. Exactly, so. that's the common misconception. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, leadership is learned in every stage of life. Perfect. Yeah. Anybody here? Anyone home? Yeah. To keep up with the p pace of uh, change in the world. Yes. Actually. Change, uh, change evolve. is That's the permanent fact Our, our key word yes. was evolve. evolve. Change with the evolve. times because things are dynamic around you. Yes. You cannot stick to the past. What's relevant today need not be relevant tomorrow. Three main questions that are very important and essential in any type of process. We're talking about independent life learning. We need to see. Choose one of these quotes. <coughs> vote which one is most critical to you as a group. And then answer what, why, and how. Can you let us know? I need one of the groups just to share with me. Go for the second one. Good teaching is more a giving of right questions than a giving of right answers. Yes. Because uh, uh, as science teachers, uh, we tend to develop a thinking mind in any student, every student. Critical thinking, analyze it. So the questions make them uh, get the answers as, as to how and why of every question. Yes. That's the solution. That's a solution. Yes. Actually, that's very important because the point is that the content is changing. If you look back at what we've been taught, it has totally evolved and changed by now. So we don't really need to focus on the content. The content is just the material that we can use the different processes and master the skills to reach somewhere with these students. We need these students, we don't teach them for today, we're teaching them for tomorrow. tomorrow. So if we just teach them what we know as information, as a content, we're really depriving them of their right to learn. They need to master these skills of asking questions because they're going to do it later on their own. Okay? Who else can share another quote with a perspective? Yes. Um, the fourth one, when a student fails, we as teachers to have faith. Uh, what, we, what we understand from this quote is that we teachers are like uh, the main motivators. Uh, I need you just to come and stand here. Is this different sheets for the Yes, yes. yes. Uh, okay, uh, guys, guys. I just need to clarify one thing. I'm not here because... So, all together, we have it all. But any one of us alone is not good enough. So, please, we're here to hear each other and to learn from each other. So, listen. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, okay, we've chosen the fourth one. When our students fail, we as teachers, to have faith. Now, it's not a negative statement, but the, if you look uh, closely at it, uh, we teachers are responsible for the whole lifetime of the student. We, we are the motivator, we are the inspiration behind it. So we need to focus on every child, be it a special need, be a gifted child. So we look at everybody in an equal way and give our best. Also, we need to uh, reflect back on what our strategies were and try to transform it to the, to the best for the students. In a sense, we, we kind of uh, change our way of teaching in case needed so that the child performs the best in the class. And each and every child, now it comes out from the family, the way they are brought up from the family and how they function in the class. So the teacher has a sixth sense to judge how what is going behind the mind of the child. 
So in case we look closely at each child and give the, a tailor-made thing what they need, I mean, they can, it's, uh, sky is the limit, be it practical way or in theory way. And, and I'm sure you'll all agree, you're pleasantly surprised when students come up with beautiful projects and sayings and wonderful answers when we don't even expect from them. So we think, oh, I'm, I'm sure, like we can pat our backs. Maybe I motivated them and made a difference to their lives a lot. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. This is great. Thank you. So independent learning. <laughs> independent learning is something where we give the credit to our students. We believe in them. And they need to see themselves in the mirror that they can make it on their own. We're just being facilitators. We're just here to guide them. We're not to be dictators. We're not to have the whole authority over class. We need to give them their own space. We need to give them their own space to have choices, to express themselves in their own way, with their own strength, with their own intelligences. They need to collaborate together. They need to express their individuality. We don't need our students to be a copy and paste of ourselves or of each other. We need them to be their own because this is the best way they can be. A very important thing is lifelong learning is learning autonomy. It's self-directing process. And the students are self-motivated to learn. This is very, very critical. And I usually start any workshop by starting with the motivation. Positive thinking. It's a key aspect of all the learning perspectives. We need to encourage our students. We need to let them uh, think positively, see themselves positively in their abilities, trust the, what they can do. So uh, positive thinking, I usually have this quote that I usually start with the first day of each academic year. Positive thinkers, they see the invisible, touch the intangible, and achieve the impossible. We need our students to be on that phase, on that stage. Uh, there is a motivational video here, which I use with my students, and it really works like magic, and I want you to have a look at it. Lev Ligotsky was a writer, just a sec. Dismissed from drama school with a note that read, wasting her time, she's too shy to put her best foot forward. Turned down by the Decca recording company who said, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out. A failed soldier, farmer, and real estate agent. At 38 years old, he went to work for his father as a handyman. Cut from the high school basketball team, he went home, locked himself in his room, and cried. too stupid to learn anything, and he should go into a field where he might succeed by virtue of his pleasant personality. Fired from a newspaper because he lacked imagination and had no original ideas. His fiance died, he failed in business twice, he had a nervous breakdown, and he was defeated in eight elections. If you've never failed, you've never lived. thing that I need to clarify here, all of these students were outcasted from their schools because the system was wrong, because the system wanted to shape them in a certain way. If we are trying to give them their own space so that they learn in their own way with their own perspective, they will shine. We need to give them that space. We need to give them that control over their own learning. Uh, independent learning is mainly related to constructivism. It's a learning theory talking about that all the individuals build their own knowledge, synthesize their own knowledge through different experiences. And they relate what they learn today regarding to any prior knowledge or any previous experience of what they have learned before. They start the linking, they start the modification, they start correcting any misconception till they formulate the new synthesized knowledge of today. So it's a continuous process where they depend on themselves taking, uh, experiencing, uh, collaborating, and interacting with their environment. And that's why it's very important that in your class, your environment is stimulating for the learning process in, what, in, in, in many contexts. Another thing which is very important, part of that can take a whole month in explanation. <coughs> Metacognition is the process of learning about learning, thinking about thinking. And that's essential in independent lifelong learning. We don't teach the students so that they can copy what we're doing. 
we teach them so that they can do much better on their own. We teach skills, we teach processes, and it's not the content anymore. This is very important. Modern communication is talking about thematic education. There are no subjects anymore. There is a theme where students are integrating all the subjects with all the topics using all their life adaptive skills in order to thrive and to meet the future challenges. So we need to focus on skills and on processes. Processes like group work, like uh, uh, presentation skills, like the lab work, like uh, summarization, like constructing concept map, like any process that you're using, any skill, whether it's questioning, predicting, uh, synthesizing knowledge, uh, paraphrasing, editing, whatever you're doing with your students, you need to focus upon. Because these are the skills that are gonna last. When Constructivism is a theory of knowledge that I learned about in college, centered around individual learning, constructing meaning and understanding. The individual is where we start, essentially the most important part. Individuals are information constructors, and what they construct depends on the culture perspectives. Each one is unique. All of our minds have a different peak. What is it you want to seek? The individual is where we start, essentially the most important part. The issue did mention that assimilation and accommodation is how we process information. With assimilation, you take in information that doesn't change your knowledge foundation. But with accommodation, there can't be frustration. With an intervention of new information as you learn your misconceptions. The individual is where we start, essentially the most important part. But then and again, we're not alone on this planet that we call home. Knowledge that works in a social context, as Vygotsky did suggest. As learners, as we make up a community, teachers, peers, most important family. The individual is where we start, essentially the most important part. We construct our knowledge socially when I teach you and you teach me. One statement from each group. One statement. One statement. Yes. Uh, knowledge is something which cannot be learned in isolation. Yes. Perfect. In social context. Yes. Start with the individual. Start with the individual. The most important thing. I totally agree. Yes. Anybody? Skills are most important. Skills are most important. Actually, there is something that Aramagatsky uh, explained about learning and independent learning, which is very, very important and critical for us as educators and teachers to know is that our students can do something on their own. This is the zone of the actual development. They are already mastering such skills and such processes. They can thrive on that space on their own. This is we call the zone of actual development. And there is another zone, which is the zone of potential development. Like if I'm gonna say, this student has got the ability to do so, and this, student has got the capability of doing so, but he cannot do it on his own. So if I'm giving a certain student the very easy work that he or she can do on her own, that would lead to boredom. That goes to chaos in class because they're not challenged. And if I'm giving them a really challenging task which is beyond their ability, that would be frustration. And we don't need any of these. We need the middle zone. And this middle zone, which is identified as zone of proximate development. The zone of proximate development is that zone where that student can do that task by my help, by my guidance, by me facilitating that work for that student. This is the zone of proximal, uh, proximal development. So that student can just bridge that gap through that zone. And that zone is only gonna be passed by us we're going to help our student to pass. How? By three main things. First, by modeling. By modeling. We as facilitators, we as guide, we have to model a new strategy. We have to model the process. We have to model the application and the implication of any skill, of any concept. We have to model. Another thing, like modeling, is demonstrating. Demonstrations. Making demonstrations. Showing the students why does that really matter and how it's applicable in their own life? The most critical thing is scaffolding. Scaffolding is assisting the students to do the job that they can do on their own by our help, by our guidance. This we call scaffolding. If I'm 
teaching my students about the concept mapping, about the sequential, the Venn diagram, the cyclic, the wheel, the T-chart, spider web, hierarchical, and fishbone. I'm teaching them each of these, and I'm telling them how to use them. And then at the beginning, at the beginning, I'm just gonna give them one and show them as a class discussion and do it together. And then I'm going to give them a blank one that they should fill on their own to find the interconnection between the different relationships. But finally, I'm gonna give them uh, active reading sheet and they have to construct their own concept map, choose which one is more convenient according to the relationship between the concepts. So I'm removing, withdrawing my support gradually, but it took stages, nothing abruptly. If I'm talking about, who else can give me an example of scaffolding? Supporting your student and then removing that support gradually till they are on the task. Anybody? Writing, so, writing modeling, frame. demonstrations, and writing framework. Yes? Writing frame would be writing for a, sc for a scaffold. Yes. So writing frame for different types of learners for higher ability would have less, lower ability would have more structure to help them to achieve whichever task is. What exactly. You Actually, we can do this with 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 everything. With the experimentation, giving them the steps, giving them the scientific methods, how to think, how to follow. And then gradually I give them more credit so that they can design their own experiment, they can uh, choose their own topic for the science fair project and start applying step by step. Another aspect which was very important of that study is that the social context. It's very important to let the students always work as partners or as groups in any of your classes. Because as this theory, it postulates that all the students learn from this social context and they contextualize what they learn in that meaningful setting. So you have great potentials. Gardner said that each of the students has got eight multiple intelligences in all aspects. You need to invest what you've got because actually these students all together sitting on that table have got more potential than you do. You need to invest that. But what's most important when you're using a certain process or skill you need to tell them what is that, why we're doing that, and how we should do that. This is are very critical, they're very simple, we all know them, but many times we skip them because there is no time for that. Actually, that's the most significant part. What is that, what I'm doing? Go deep and start explaining what you're really doing with the students. Students really appreciate when they know what they're doing, the rationale for what they're doing in the class. Manipulatives. We consider the environment of your class and any manipulatives, anything that you give to your students as a third or a second teacher. Third teacher, because you are one, the students, the peers together, and a second teacher, and the classroom and the manipulatives, and any materialistic item that you give to them is the third teacher. The plan. I'm gonna go very quickly again. The curriculum. There are three perspectives of the curriculum, the transmission, the transaction, and the transformational. With the constructivism, we're talking about the transactional mainly. The transactional curriculum is when we decide, we implement and we start planning a curriculum that is co-directed with the students and the teachers. So we, as teachers and the students, we collaborate, we investigate together, and we formulate a transactional curriculum which means that the student has got a positive role all through the way. All through the way of planning the curriculum, the student is being respected, the student is being given space to express his interest, his needs, uh, what he's interested in, his capabilities. There is space for that student to be in that curriculum. It's not only related to me. The old one was just transmission. We think as uh, adults that this is the information that the students need to know and learn. In the transactional, no. It's we, uh, the students and the teachers, they co-work together to postulate and to formate that transactional uh, curriculum. The most modern one is the transformational, where the student is taking the upper hand. That aspect is a little bit advanced for us at the moment, but Many of the schools and many of the teachers, they start to combine between the transactional and the transformational, where we're giving authority to these students after a time of practice, how they can guide the process according to their learning styles, to their intelligences, to their preferences, and according to their 
future destinations. So they have an input of what to be taught, and many times we do it. When you have your, uh, whether it's a smart board, a normal board, and you have a list of strategies, and you ask your students every single day, which strategy you want to use, which type of activity you're going to choose. In, in giving projects, you let your students choose this type of project because it's more convenient to them. They're gonna start in that thing, and sometimes they can be challenged with certain topics. So giving choices is very important. Giving alternative assignments is very important. So, that's the part of the curriculum. Uh, the teaching, as we said, active learning strategies. The students are to be active all the time. You are the coach, you're the maestro. They are the players. They need to do the work, not you. You're a facilitator, you're a guide. As long as the teacher is standing on the board like I'm doing now, this is obsolete, because of just of the run of time. So, you don't need to be here. The show must go on without you. Last time on Sunday, I was here in the KHDA for rehearsal, and actually, I was late like 10 minutes in my class. And then I went and I found that everything is being settled. The strategies, the objectives, the title, and everything, and the students are sitting in groups and trying to finish the work from before. This is the way it should be. Your presence or absence are not any more important. Okay, so the more you're useless in your class, the more you're a successful facilitator. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, active uh, teaching strategies. Can you just, in 20 seconds, share with each other the best, the best technique, the best activity, the best active learning strategy, where you really show when the KHDA inspection is coming? Share. <laughs> Seriously, let's make use of the time. Share. Yeah, go. <laughs> How many years you have been? That these are strategies that are for life. It's not for now. It's not for science or biology or chemistry. It's for life, and they actually start using it with all other subjects. Uh, concept mapping is very important to show the interconnection between relationships, group work, and partnering, investing the synergistic potential within each of the individuals. Teach you how to be a good leader, and in the same way, how to be a good follower, because you're changing positions all the time. Uh, very important thing using rubrics. Rubrics is a quality of standards and in inspection or accreditation you're using the same standards as a, an adult. They need to focus on that. How? We use it with any process or with any product. Any process or any product. Before, during and after. Before, the students know, need to know what's expected. During, they need to monitor and see that they're on the right track. After, which is the most important part, is that they need to reflect. They need to reflect on what they've done. They need to make self-assessment. Each term you need to reflect with your students. Have a new academic focus for term two and reflect on term one. Reflect on the previous experiment. Reflect on that process of the group work. Why it was not that specific. So there are four types of reflection. Reflection on content, which is going on daily basis. Daily basis. What have I learned? How can I apply this in real life? Two major questions reflecting on any content. The second thing, process. I'm using experimentation. I'm using group work. I'm using editing, constructing, whatever. This process, I'm reflecting on the process. How did that process help me grow and develop? What did I learn from that process? The second thing, how can I improve that process? Reflection, the main focus of reflection is improvement. So usually there is another question about improvement. Any product. I ask my students to construct a stair project. A stair project is a stair, uh, stand-alone instructional resource. The best way to teach students the best way to let students learn is to make them teach. They peer coach each other. What's really important is that I wanted to integrate technology, English language, science, and art. I make them construct a certain interactive uh, technological resource that they can share with other students, with their family members, of what they have learned. They are reflecting, they are giving their best. Actually, I've seen these and I've got samples here to show you that these students have been so creative and they have gone so far beyond my own limits. They made certain technological aspects that I know nothing about, but they can do it. So that's part, and each time they're going to reflect and they're going to use the rubric and they're going to self-edit and peer edit and then the final <coughs> evaluation. Uh, other strategies that active note-taking. You know the, the different levels of Bloom's taxonomy for sure? Yeah. Knowledge comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, evaluation. 
Copying is not a level of them. Copying is not a level of them. Never, ever let anybody witness your student writing something from the book. Copying, it's not a level. That student at that time is not thinking at all. So we call it active learning strategy. What do I mean? You saw a video, you had an experiment, you had a discussion, let the students write from such protocols, and then they can discuss, and then they can review, and then they can edit, and then they can validate their knowledge from different resources. So never uh, copy from the board, and using the internet and technology, it would be plagiarism, no copy and paste, referencing and recitation, and the blog review and all that stuff. Uh, if we're talking about uh, debating case studies, which mainly is about uh, analysis. If we're talking about problem solving techniques, using the scientific methods, using the different types of uh, problem solving techniques with the different types of and patterns of thinking. And what's really important also is give them the problem management techniques. Because many times we teach them problem solving just to break down the problem and then the solution. Many of the students don't know how to solve a problem. I mean solve in practical way solve them in a materialistic way in their own life context. So I have a, a problem um, solving technique, which is a per tet. It's uh, mainly talking about prevention. It's talking about uh, reduction, about termination, about redirection of the problem. There are six approaches of problem solving. <laughs> the, 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 the least one is just to prevent the problem. But the most significant one is redirecting the problem, seeing the problem in a different way, so it's no more a problem. So there are different approaches. Just think about, I'm giving problem solving as just breaking down the problem. I need to let them solve it till the very end. I wish I have more time to share more details. Um, summarizing, reviewing, uh, checking, validating, uh, debating, interactive discussion. Metaphors and analogy are very important for critical thinking to relate this to your daily life. Uh, another aspect of uh, personal development, I call it the self-CDM, which starts by students need to learn the self-control as a beginning, and then reach self-discipline to finally reach self-management. This is very important. It's not quite related to science as science, but it relates to the independent uh, lifelong learning as a life skill. Uh, the assessment. We have four types of assessment that work on independent learning. First, the diagnostic. We need to diagnose our students' strengths and weaknesses, their potential, their capabilities, and their uh, abilities. So diagnostic, it can be about the development level, it can be about the VARC, the learning style, it can be about the multiple intelligences, it can be of different aspects. And the most important thing, which is really practical, is assessing prior knowledge. This is the basics for differentiation, this is the basics for independent learning, constructivism, all the modern educational theories. It's about seeing where that student stands and then applying what really matters for that student. So assessing prior knowledge, different techniques, we all know them well, the boxing off, the graffiti chart, the KWL, and any concept maps that are blank and then like a spider web brainstorming and then they fill up the gaps and then you start uh, managing your own uh, class. The second type of assessment is the formative assessment and it's an ongoing process on a daily basis. And the point is that formative assessment is assessment for learning, not of learning. The final assessment, the summative, is the one of learning. But the one that is very critical, is very critical and is essential nowadays is the formative. Because that is the indicator for the student's growth we need to look at the student performance, how they're doing, and that part where we reflect on the progress. That's why when you have a portfolio project and you see the difference between that month and the other, between term one and term two, that's the difference when each time you uh, uh, assess yourself using the rubric in that project or in that experiment, and you see the difference and let the student reflect on that. Formative assessment, ongoing process, it's leading and it's guiding your instruction. It's guiding even the summative assessment and how it's gonna be. This is for you and for them and for the whole process. Formative, formative, formative assessment. Sorry, Mr. Cyrus, can I just ask how long you... Performances and products. These are the steps with any vision, with any goal that you want. Independent learning, we plan for it through the curriculum assessment and instruction, the action, the methodologies, the strategies that you use. 
and the monitoring using the, the rubric and the level of assessment, the quality standards that you put for yourself or the school or the government or the KHDA. And then you usually start reviewing, am I on the right track? And never do this alone. All these steps, you need collaboration. You need your colleagues from your science department or from other departments. You need administrative people. You need different perspective. And if you are up to the level, include students. Include students in these meetings where you review, where you recheck, where you're going to redesign and put impact. Okay, this is essential and believe it or not, you're going to be amazed how your students can add an input that is magnificent to you and to your school. And then the evidence, as we said, evidence as growth in the different milestone of development because science is related to life. You can relate and integrate science with anything that comes to you. And uh, this is actually the real cycle which I took that from. You know that cycle? Have you seen it before? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> they call it the self-assessment cycle. I call it the self-improvement cycle. Because actually, assessment is the way for improvement. Any vision that you have, put it on that cycle and go on and you're going to reach somewhere. And every time you're going to remodify and recheck and redesign that goal because you have reached so, so far, there is, no mass, there is no peak that is so high for you. And whenever you reach a mountain, there is another peak waiting for you. Any questions? <laughs> any questions? Uh, any documents. You can just leave your email if you need uh, all the documents here. Just leave your email. Top. Just uh, can I ask you a favor? I'll ask you a favor. I have a reflection sheet for me, and I want to give it to you. And if you need all these materials and even samples of the projects that I've made.